This is Tears of Autumn. Hana Amayo stood at the railing of the small ship that shuddered toward America in a turbulent November sea. She shivered as she pulled the folds of her silk kimono close to her throat and tightened the wool shawl about her shoulders. She was thin and small, her dark eyes shadowed in her pale face, her black hair piled high on a pomodoro that seemed too heavy for so slight a woman. She clung to the moist rail and breathed the damp salt air deep into her lungs. Her body seemed leaden and lifeless, as though it were, the, were simply the vehicle transporting her soul to a strange new life, and she longed with childlike intensity to be home again in Oka Village. She longed to see the bright persimmon dotting the barren tree beside the thatched roofs, to see the fields of golden rice stretching to the mountains, where only last fall she had gathered plump white mushrooms, and to see once more the maple trees lacing their flaming colors through the green pine. If only she could see a familiar face, eat a meal without retching, walk on solid ground, and stretch. Out at night on a tatami mat, instead of in a hard, narrow bunk. She thought now of seeking the warm shelter of her bunk, but could not bear to face the relentless smell of fish that penetrated the lower decks. Why did I ever leave Japan? She wondered bitterly. Why did I ever listen to my uncle? And yet she knew it was she herself who had begun the chain of events that placed her on this heaving ship. It was she who had first planted in her uncle the thought that she would make a good wife for Taro, the lonely man who had gone to America to make his home in Oakland, California. It all began one day when her uncle had come to visit her mother. I must find a nice young bride, he said. He had said, startling Hana with this blunt talk of marriage in her presence. She blushed and was ready to leave the room when her uncle quickly added, My good friend Takeda has a son in America. I must find someone willing to travel to that land. This last remark was intended to indicate to Hana and her mother that he didn't consider this a suitable prospect for Hana, who was the youngest daughter of what once had been a fine family. Her father, until his death fifteen years ago, had been the longest landholder of the village and one of its last samurai. They had once had many servants and field hands, but now all of that was changed. Their money was gone. Hana's three older sisters had made good marriages, and the eldest remained in their home with her husband to carry on the Omaya name and perpetuate their homestead. Her other sisters had married merchants in Osaka and Nagoya and were living comfortably. Now that Hana was 21, finding a proper husband for her had taken on an urgency that produced an embarrassing secretive air over the entire matter. Usually, her mother didn't speak of it until they were lying side by side on their quilts at night. Then, under the protective cover of darkness, she would suggest one name and then another, hoping that Hana would indicate an interest in one of them. Her uncle spoke freely of Taro Takeda, only because he was so sure Hana would never consider him. He is a conscientious, hard-working man who has been in the United States for almost 10 years. He is 31, operates a small shop, and rents some rooms above the shop where he lives. Her uncle rubbed his chin thoughtfully. He could provide well for a wife, he added. Ah, Hannah's mother said softly. You say he is successful in his, this business? Hannah's sister inquired. His father tells me he sells many things in his shop. Clothing, stockings, needles, thread, and buttons, such things as that. He also sells bean paste, pickle radish, bean cake, and soy sauce. A wife of his would not go cold or hungry. They all nodded, each of them picturing this merchant in varying degrees of success and affluence. There were many Japanese immigrating to America these days, and Hana had heard of the picture brides who went with nothing more than an exchange of photographs to bind them to a strange man. Taro-san is lonely, her uncle continued. I wanted to find for him a young woman who was strong and brave enough to cross the ocean alone. It would certainly be a different kind of life, Hana's sister ventured, and for a moment, Hana thought she glimpsed a longing ordinarily concealed behind her quiet, obedient face. In that same instant, Hana knew she wanted more for herself than her sisters had in their proper arranged and loveless marriages. She wanted to escape the smothering strictures of life in her village. She certainly was not going to marry a farmer and spend her life working besides him planting, weeding, and harvesting in the rice paddies until her back became bent from too many years of stooping, and her skin was turned to brown leather by the sun and wind. Neither did she particularly relish the idea of marrying a merchant in a big city as her two sisters had done. Since her mother objected to her going to, 
Tokyo to seek employment as a teacher, perhaps she would consent to a flight to America for what seemed a proper and respectable marriage. Almost before she realized what she was doing, she spoke to her uncle. Oji-san, perhaps I should go to America to make this lonely man a good wife. You, Hana-chan? Her uncle observed her with startled curiosity. You would go all alone to a foreign land so far away from your mother and family? I would not allow it, her mother spoke fiercely. Hana was her youngest, and she had lavished upon her the attention and latitude that often befell the last child. How could she permit her to travel so far, even to marry the son of Takeda, who was known to, to her brother? But now a notion that had seemed quite impossible a moment before was lodged in, recept in his receptive mind, and Hana's uncle grasped it with the pleasure that comes from an unexpected discovery. You know, he said, looking at Hana, it might be a good life in America. Hana felt a sudden, a faint fluttering in her heart. Perhaps this lonely man in America was her means of escaping both the village and the encirclement of her family. Her uncle spoke with increasing enthusiasm of sending Hana to become Taro's wife. And the husband of Hana's sister, who was head of their household, spoke with equal eagerness. Although he never said so, Hana guessed he would be pleased to be rid of her. The spirited younger sister who stirred up his placid life with what he considered radical ideas about life and the role of women. He often claimed that Hana had too much schooling for a girl. She had graduated from women's high school in Kyoto, which gave her five more years of schooling than her older sister. It has addled her brain, all that learning from those books, he said when he tried of arguing with Hana. A man's word carried much weight for Hannah's mother. Pressed by the two men, she consulted her other daughters and their husbands. She discussed the matter carefully with her brother and asked the village priest. Finally, she agreed to an exchange of family histories and an investigation was begun into Taro Takada's, or Takada's family, his education, and his health, so that they could be assured that there was no insanity or tuberculosis or police records concealed in his family past. Soon, Hana's uncle was devoting his energies entirely to serving as go-between for Hana's mother and Taro Takada, Takeda's father. When at last an agreement to the marriage was almost reached, Taro wrote his first letter to Hana. It was brief and proper and gave no more clue to his character than the stiff formal portrait taken at his graduation from middle school. Hana's uncle had given her the picture with apologies from his parents because it was the only photo that they had of him and it was not a flattering likeness. Hana hid the letter and photograph in the sleeve of her kimono and took them to the outhouse to study in private. Squinting in the dim light and trying to ignore the foul odor, she read and reread Taro's letter, trying to find the real man somewhere in the sparse, unbending prose. By the time he sent her money for her steamship tickets, she had received ten more letters, but none revealed much more of the man than the first, and none did he disclose his loneliness or his need. But Hana understood this. In fact, she would have recoiled from a man who bared his intimate thoughts to her so soon. After all, they would have a lifetime together to get to know each other. So it was that Hana had left her family and sailed alone to America with a small hope tre trembling inside of her. Tomorrow, at last, the ship would dock in San Francisco, and she would meet face-to-face the, -face the man she would soon marry. Hana was overcome with excitement at the thought of being in America, and terrified of the meeting about to take place. What would she say to Taro Takeda when they first met, and for all the days and years after? Hana wondered about the flat above the ship. Perhaps it would be luxuriously furnished with the finest of brocades and liqueurs, and perhaps there would be a servant, although he had not been mentioned. She worried whether she would be able to manage on the meager English she had learned at the women's high school. The overwhelming anxiety from the day to come and the violent rolling of the ship were more than Hana could bear. Shuddering in the face of the wind, she leaned over the railing and became violently and wretchedly ill. By five the next morning, Hana was up and dressed in her finest purple silk kimono and coat. She could not eat the bean soup and rice that appeared for breakfast and, could, took, and took only a few bites of the yellow pickled radish. Her bags, which had scarcely been touched since she boarded the ship, were easily packed, for all they contained were her kimonos and some of her favorite books. The large willow basket, tightly secured by a rope, remained under the bunk, untouched since her uncle had placed it there. She had not befriended the other women in her cabin, for they had lain in their bunks for most of the journey, too, sick to be company to anyone. 
Each morning, Hana had fled the closeness of the sleeping quarters and spent most of the day huddled in a corner of the deck, listening to the lonely songs of some Russians also traveling to an alien land. As the ship approached land, Hana hurried up to the deck to look out at the gray expanse of the ocean and sky, eager for a first glimpse of her new homeland. We won't be docking until almost noon, one of the deckhands told her. Hannah nodded. I can wait, she answered, but the last hour seemed the longest. When she set foot on American soil at last, it was not in the city of San Francisco she had expected, but on Angel Island, where all third-class passengers were taken. She spent two miserable days and nights waiting as the immigrants were questioned by officials, examined for trachoma and tuberculosis, and tested for hookworm by a woman who collected their stools on tin pie plates. Hannah was relieved she could produce her own, not having to borrow a little from someone else, as some of the women had to do. It was a bewildering, degrading beginning, and Hannah was sick with anxiety, wondering if she would ever be released. On the third day, a Japanese messenger from San Francisco appeared with a letter from her, for her from Taro. He had written it the day of her arrival, but it had not reached her for two days. Taro welcomed her to America and told her that the bearer of the letter would inform Taro when she was to be released so he could be at the pier to meet her. The letter eased her anxiety for a while, but as soon as she was released and boarded the launch for San Francisco, new fears rose up to smother her with a feeling almost of dread. The early morning mist had become a light, chilling rain, and on the pier, black umbrellas bobbed here and there, making the task of recognition even harder. Hannah searched desperately for a face that resembled the photo. She had studied so long and hard. Suppose he hadn't come. What would she do then? Hannah took a deep breath, lifted her head, and walked slowly from the launch. The moment she was on the pier, a man in a black coat wearing a derby and carrying an umbrella came quickly to her side. He was of slight build, not much taller than she, and his face was shallow and pale. He bowed stiffly and murmured, You have had a long trip, Miss Omaya. I hope you are well. Hannah caught her breath. You are Takeda's son? she asked. He removed his hat and Hannah was further startled to see that he was already turning bald. You are Takeda's son? she asked again. She looked older than thirty-one. I am afraid I no longer resemble the early photo my parents gave you. I am sorry. Hannah had not meant to begin like this. It was not going well. No, no, she said quickly. It's just that I, that is, I'm, I'm terribly nervous. Hannah stopped abruptly too, flustered to go on. I understand, Taro said gently. You will feel better when you get to meet my friends and have some tea. Mr. and Mrs. Toda are expecting you in Oakland. You will be staying with them until... He could not bring himself to mention the marriage just yet, and Hannah was grateful he hadn't. He quickly made arrangements to have her baggage sent to Oakland, then led her carefully along the rain-slick pier toward the streetcar that would take them to the ferry. Hannah shuddered at the sight of another boat, and as they climbed to its upper deck, she felt a queasy tightening in her stomach. I hope it will not rock too much, she said anxiously. Is it many hours to, you, to your city? Taro laughed for the first time since their meeting, revealing the gold fillings of his teeth. Oakland is just across the bay, he explained. We will be there in twenty minutes. Raising a hand to cover her mouth, Hannah laughed with him and suddenly felt better. I am in America now, she thought, and this is the man I came to marry. Then she sat down carefully beside Taro, so no part of their clothing touched.